Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Discover 2016 Las Vegas. Brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Now, here's your host, Dave Vellante. Welcome back to HPE Discover 2016, everybody. This is theCUBE. theCUBE goes out to the events. We extract the signal from the noise. We got a crowd chat going on, crowdchat.net slash HPE Discover. Essentially, we're documenting a transcript of all the CUBE interviews. Uh, check out siliconangle.tv and siliconangle.com for all the news. Check out wikibon.com for all the research. Vish Malshand is here, he's back. We're going we're gonna to geek out a little bit on storage, Vish. We haven't had time to sit here and just one-on-one -on -one talk about you know, what's going on in the storage business. So I'm really excited for the, the activity that I'm seeing, the momentum that you guys have. So first of all, congratulations on all the success. Thank you, Dave, thank you. you know, Great been, to be here it's on. It's been quite a journey. Let's go back a little bit. I just love having this conversation, a little armchair conversation. But when you think back to, to 3PAR, when you guys started the company in a, in a, in a really exciting time, uh, but you had this vision of kind of utility storage, you know, yes. the, the storage service provider yes. market, which evolved, of course, into cloud, cloud storage. But you really went after a very difficult segment to go after, tier one, Block storage, dominated by EMC, obviously Hitachi, you know, so to a certain extent IBM, yeah. you were able to crack that market, achieve escape velocity in a very difficult time after the dot-com boom, and then land as a public company. You know, great, successful exit, but it wasn't easy. Yes. You know, because you had to expand internationally, and then all of a sudden, you know, everybody wants to buy you, $2.5 billion exit, boom and you're inside of HP. And the, the rest of the story is history, but it's a great one. So first of all, up until that point, you know, it had to be an exciting ride for you. I mean, I don't know if you've been through anything like that before. Yeah, I mean, you know, this, is, this has been a great, great ride, right? And, uh, you know, while I was not there at 3 Par from the early start, I was there for some number of years. And, uh, you know, it did go through several, we had, uh, you know, several sort of phases where it was very difficult, right? The, uh, the dot com, uh, the economy, economy slowdowns, uh, and many companies, you know, didn't survive, right, through that. And, and so, you know, when we finally sort of culminated with the acquisition by HP, it sort of started the next phase, right, of, uh, of development and, uh, and growth. And so far, it's been, it's been a very, very good journey for well, us. Well, and then, you know, again, HP, at the time, HP, uh, Mark Hurd was the CEO, Dave Donatelli was sort of the head of storage and wanted to do this acquisition. Uh, and it was expensive acquisition, it was 2.5 billion, but it turned out to be a great IRR for, for HP. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I remember uh, the rationale was, we can take this architecture and go small to large. Correct. At the, at the time, they didn't say, we can take this same architecture and, and, and go into flash, right? What everybody predicted, myself included, and I was wrong, was that HP was going to, at, in, at the time HP, now of course HPE, was going to have to buy an all flash player. And you guys said, no, the architecture is going to lend itself to flash. That's how it was designed, maybe some luck, maybe some brilliance. And everybody said, oh boy, bolt on. Right. You know, the, the, the balance sheet is not going to support an acquisition. That's just sort of, they have, if you can't fix it, feature it, marketing, but okay. But it turned out to be just the case. Right, that you were able to transition Absolutely. and become a leader. Absolutely. Amazing, amazing story. No, I think we have to thank our customers and we have to thank the founders of 3PAR. And, uh, you know, and I think while HP at that time didn't say publicly that you know, they were thinking about Flash, while they didn't publicly state it, they were thinking about Flash and credit to the evaluators at HP looking at the 3PAR architecture, they had that on their mind. And they saw that potential. Right, and and again, the long-term planning, and yeah, okay. And so they did see that potential. Now, of course, there's always a, a long road between potential and then delivery, and then between delivery and adoption, right? Uh, and there are many, many different things that go along the way of those pieces. But you know, credit to HP for for having or HP at that time for having having that that force. Well, and you were there in the thick of it. You were in the trenches during that that yes. transition. Yes. What was that like? I mean, requirements dealing with the, the technical hurdles, you know, working with customers, figuring right. out the pricing models. Right. right. What was that like? Yeah, you know, the, um, the, the, the journey, I think you're referring to the, 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 when we decided to go all flash. Yeah, and the, people, right? the supplier, the yeah. demand supply, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so it, many factors. There's so many that. factors, right? So from a, from, a products, from a product strategy perspective, I think the first thing we had to handle was, okay, 
let's make a decision. And at that time, there were some debates on, is the flash market going to be driven primarily by latency, IOPS, performance, right? And only performance, right? And you really want to drive to that really, really razor edge of performance. And we had a little bit of a different view there, right? Uh, and some of us in the company said, no, you know, performance is very important. It's fundamental, but it's not enough by itself, right? The affordability is a key factor, and so are the data services. And so getting through all of those um, initial debates was important. And then, once we got past the debate, right, and we brought it to Dave Donatelli, and you know, he, he supported us, right, through, through uh, that time. Uh, getting past those debates then required the hard work of, okay, Flash is different, right? What do you do different? How do you engineer that different? If you remember, we announced um, the 7,000 in 2012. We announced the first all Flash product in June 2013. So that was 18 months, right? So that was 18 months worth of engineering work that went into three-power all Flash. Now, there was a lot of good leverage we could have taken broad because of the architecture, but that was good 18 months worth of engineering. And you've come out of it with an extremely competitive, low latency product with the industry's, I think I can say this, unquestionably the industry's most robust and mature all flash stack. I mean, that's a no brainer, right? There's nobody even close to having the hardened mature stack that three par has I think that's with all of, those other attributes. Yeah, I think that's one of our challenges now, Dave. I think, you know, um, that richness of the stack, while it's a massive strength, I think we got to do a better job of explaining that to more and more customers, right? Because as you, soon as you understand it and you, and, and you see the delta differences, right? Um, I'll give you a couple that are really key. Ability to move data non-disruptively, peer motion. People just love that, right? Even if I had to move an age data off a flash array to something else, being able to peer motion that, big, big one. Uh, another one, peer persistence, active, active failover um, with transparent orchestration. People love that. The customers really resonate to that, to that, to that solution, right? So um, the richness is the strength, and then making sure people understand it, that's, that's, that's work for us. So you've created, I mean, essentially a mainframe class set of data services at you know, SMB or high-end SMB up pricing. I mean, it's very powerful. Okay, so now we're here today, 2016. The big announcements this week were focused on density Manish Goyal at his uh, breakout session showed, <laughs> I love the slide, it was on Twitter, showed all these VMAXs and all these you know, HDS boxes and then this you know, tiny little three par, you know, small configuration. Right. What, what's the messaging around you know, the density and, and all flash? Yeah, so, so maybe first, important to step back, Dave, and look at you know, the three vectors that we've always talked about, performance, affordability, and enterprise class data services. And so, if you, if you dig into the affordability section now, or the affordability vector, to me that's where density plays, right? Because that great density allows you to save power, cooling, floor space, and you know, if you're a large service provider, or, or, or large enterprise, uh, private cloud provider, uh, that density always matters. Uh, if you have, uh, we have service providers in Tokyo, Japan, and I asked them, I said, could you use a large SSD if we doubled capacity? And the answer was, bring it on, Vish. The more you double every time, the more we take on. We have growth, uh, and you know, if you can help us either maintain density or reduce density, that's always welcome. So this, um, this announcement, we announced um, two new drives, right? 7.68 and 15.36. Last year, we announced 3.84. The year before that, 1.92. So it's been 2x, 2x, and now 4x, right? And I mean, if you want to take a density metric, Dave, in 2012, we were at four terabyte per rack unit. Four terabyte usable per rack unit. Uh, we are now at 536 terabytes per rack unit, hmm. okay? <laughs> and again, so let's, let's maybe shorten the window. If we look at the last 24 months, 16x improvement in density, 40% lower dollar per gig. So this is really interesting because, you, you know, we've been We've been on the all-flash bandwagon for a while at Wikibon, and Floyer's, you know, he's got his cost curves, and he shows the cost per bit of flash coming down, you know, quicker. Now, sometimes that's an anomaly. You see different, you know, uh, uh, sourcing issues that can, can affect that. Uh, but there's a debate going on in the industry, particularly driven by, uh, by Moshe and I, right, at his company with Infinidad, is saying, Infinidad. no, you don't need all-flash, you need some flash. Right. And so it's an interesting, so how do you guys, I mean, I know how you guys see it, but I wonder if you could talk about it a little bit. You believe that flash is going to be less expensive than spinning disk, 
let's say by the end of the decade, right? Um, in terms of usable, right? Because mm -hmm. you can data reduce it. Uh, TCO, we don't even talk about. I'm just right. talking about data reduction. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what's your what's your take on that? I mean, you guys are obviously betting on that, but is, are we over? Am I overstating that? No, that I, I think clearly there is this move towards what we call the all flash data center, right? And where uh, more and more of the mission critical, more and more of the IT data center spend goes to flash. Now, um, I think there's still use cases for uh, deploying hybrid systems. Um, we've had a couple that have, have come on the cube and have explained, right? One is the example of data aging. Right. Um, another one is the example of, I heard this morning from a customer that said, if I have to, by regulation, encrypt at the file and database table level, okay, and it impacts my ability to compress and dedupe at the flash level, do I still buy all flash? And I said it depends. How much performance do you need? And if you have to have a thousand spindles to get that performance, it may still be more economical with a 7.68 terabyte SSD drive. Now, but if, it is, if you don't have that number of spindles, maybe there's a consideration here for spinning, right? right. Um, so I think at the end of the day, you want to be able to have all of these tools at your hand for your disposal. And, and I think locking you in into any one approach you know, while sometimes that's forced on you because of a technical reason, if you can afford the luxury of having the option. We've seen customers go from hybrid to all flash and to what we sometimes term converge flash, right? The, the cloud was here uh, last year and they talked about 30% of data not being accessed and wanting to move that to a cold tier. So again, I, I think that this is going to continue. How about the competitive landscape? We'd love to talk about the horses on the track and we haven't done that much this week. So you guys are, are leading. EMC obviously still a very, very strong competitor. Uh, um, of course the Dell merger acquisition is going to be really interesting. You got NetApp made a move to go out and buy SolidFire and they're essentially positioning SolidFire for the service provider market only. They got Ingenio over here and Cluster yes, Ontap for yeah. everything else. Um, Hitachi I'm not as familiar with, uh, really not sure what they're doing, although I've been told they get some good, they always have good products. So, okay, but so what's the competitive landscape look like? Give us the summary there. So from a competitive point of view, it seems to me that you know, the major storage vendors are still struggling through disruption. Well, I call this the multiple plan Bs and no real plan A, right? And you know, uh, still going through the multiple offerings. I mean, even, even NetApp's most recent, Ingenio, All Flash, uh, SolidFire. Uh, EMC, I think it was very notable that at EMC World this year, there was no mention of Extreme IO. It was All Flash VNX, All Flash Unity, All Flash VMAX. And uh, you know, I, I have to imagine that must be confusing for their customers, let alone for their sales and channel partners. And if a customer were to ask and say, hey, what should I deploy? What do you recommend? Uh, you know, this must be a very bewildering set of choices, right? Yeah, and I, I left out IBM. I mean, IBM you know, bought Texas Memory Systems a while back. Good product, high performance. You know, it's kind of... But, but they belong to a class where I think data services continues to be a difficult challenge for them. They've used an approach with, with SVC. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the market data, you know, I don't know, it doesn't appear to be resonating as much. What's right? the market data saying? What, market, what data market data is showing clearly, you know, EMC, HP, Pure Storage, NetApp, playing in here. Uh, less so for IBM. Right, and Pure you know, seems to be you know, cruising, I mean, growing, obviously still losing money, but seems like a lot of momentum behind there. You run into those guys a lot, and we run to how, do you, all how the time. do you compete with Pure? What's the, you, you you know, the, the biggest thing we do when we, we compete with Pure is, first of all, the data, the data services. Yep. The fact that um, we can offer uh, peer motion, uh, peer persistence, replication, both sync and async, uh, we see that a lot, right? Uh, the other thing that we see against uh, Pure, they're essentially a, still a dual controller architecture, and not even an active, 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 passive architecture. And you know, in the world of Flash, controller performance is everything on your performance, right? And so, whether it's capacity scale, performance scale, uh, you know, where, where we beat them, <laughs> there are many places where they just don't have that scale of performance or capacity. So you're willing to get in a rock fight with any of these guys? <laughs> you know, I, I think again, we try and stay focused on the customer need, right? right? And when we talk to customers, uh, we had plenty of them this, this week at the show, right? They tell us what they need, and then to them, uh, Uptime resiliency is number one. Well, I think a lot of the uncertainty around the future of, of HP, HPE, uh, the split of the two companies is, is behind you now. 
Seems like the whole spin merge with CSC has been a real tailwind for you. Stocks at a 52 week high, right? The balance sheet looks a lot better. The Aruba acquisition, a lot of really good things lining up. You know, the other thing is we've said it a number of times, you say you focus on the customer. Customers are, have been rooting for HP this whole time. It's, a, you know, it's a, an icon of the industry. Silicon Valley basically founded in a garage at HP. So it's like HP is getting back to its roots of invent. And, I think uh, the, 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 the company split into HP has been very positive, mm -hmm. right? And there's clearly a lot more focus. Um, today, a, a blogger quoted this to me and he says he's seeing great fruits of of innovation, uh, you know, and he was mentioning to me about something called Recovery Manager Central, mm. right, which we announced uh, another version of it uh, um, at this show, and we, we have added additional enhancements, another, yet another data service, right, this ability to do flat backup, right, and he was very intrigued about the possibilities with not just flat backup as well as RMC, he also recognized that with that RMC framework and sort of keeping track of these change blocks, your ability to move data now across, say, uh, system defined to software defined, uh, there's some interesting possibilities there now with that RMC framework. And right? some application specificities uh, around SAP and Oracle. Yes. All right, Vish, we got to leave it there. Thanks so much for Dave, hanging out you. in the Great being, being here a again. Bit. <laughs> All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest right after this short break. This is theCUBE. We're live from HPE Discover 16 in Vegas.